Hey, sports history fans, this is Ariel Gonzalez from Wrestling With Heels On. Hey, when you go to a sporting event, you don't go there to be meek and mild unless you live in Japan. You go there to get freaking wild. That means bringing some attitude to your amplitude. How do you do that? You get racket. R-A-K-I-T. Racket combines a compact 7-inch megaphone, eight powerful adjustable LED lights, noisemakers, an insert you design, and it's all fully customizable to match your team's colors. Now, here's the coolest thing about this product. J.J. Abraham, the founder, was the ultimate cheer dad. He followed his daughter's cheer group around the country, and he saw parents struggling using all sorts of crazy contraptions to make some noise for their kids. And then he had an aha moment. He thought, wait, why not combine all of these doodads into an all-in-one compact device for the ultimate fan? J.J. and his team worked three years on developing version after version after version until they finally landed on Racket, R-A-K-I-T, so you can make some noise and cheer and be a part of the action. So get out there and let's get loud. Bring a Racket to your next game or competition to cheer on your favorite team or athlete. You can customize your Racket with your own logos, drawings, and names. Get beads to match your team's colors. Flashing lights add to the excitement. Are you ready to make a racket? Be part of the game. Each racket pack comes with one racket megaphone, one lanyard to keep a hold of the thing, two scratch-resistant bead packs, one clear and one color of your choice, and a 10-pack of customizable self-adhesive inserts. Currently on sale, wait for it, $24.99. To pick up your racket today, head to MyRacket.com. That's my r a k i t dot com. Now get out there and make some noise. Is us. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. The Rose Bowl. The game that inspired the college football bowl season has a long and storied history. The stadium itself is 100 years old, and in celebration of it, Pigskin Dispatch is assembling some of the top historians and authors to share the memories, people, and events that make the granddaddy of them all the special game that it is. Enjoy this Rose Bowl memory from pigskindispatch.com. Hello, my football friends. This is Darren Hayes of PigskinDispatch.com. Welcome once again to the Pig Pen, your portal of positive football history. And we are still in December, and it is Rose Bowl month, and we are celebrating the great history of the game, 100 years of the stadium, named the Rose Bowl. And we have some great guests joining us. And tonight, we have one of those, Dana Auguster, uh, a longtime historian and podcaster here on Sports History Network. Uh, Dana, welcome back to the Pig Pen. Hey, man, thank you for having me, man. It's great to be here, and um, it's always a pleasure to be with you whenever we talk about football. Yeah, Dana, you really uh, have a passion for for your teams, and uh, I'm still trying to figure out how you have the California connection because we know that the Chargers are your your football team, and UCLA is is your college football team. Right. It's uh, interesting. How, How did you ever become... Uh, a, Cal- a UCLA in uh, San Diego slash uh, Los Angeles fan. Well, if you notice, the colors are very similar. And oh, I've yeah. always been partial to powder blue for whatever reason. And um, it, it's, it's one of those rules that I have where it's really my really my real love for UCLA is actually the basketball team and the success that UCLA have had over the years. And and plus, you know, watching the Rose Bowls over the years when I was a kid, I was just fascinated with the colors and the, and, and it just seemed like their uniform just was stood apart from everybody else's. And it just was one of those things where 
I just gravitated to just like the Chargers with the powder blue and gold and and UCLA is more of a collegiate blue and old gold. So that's where that love came from as far as like my love for the school and, and those two teams, you know, even though I grew up in Louisiana, you know, that I've always been gravitated to California teams for whatever reason. I don't know why. It's just, just that just was me. And maybe I have a California soul. I don't know, but maybe that's what it is. Well, I was thinking maybe, okay, Louisiana, we know the, the abbreviation is LA and we know Los Angeles, they call it LA. If we thought maybe, eh, maybe that's maybe so, <laughs> maybe, maybe so. But you know, if you, if you ever been to Louisiana, if, then, you, if then you go to California, this is like a world of difference. So <laughs> that, that's true. I, I've been to both, both states and uh, you're right. Quite a difference there. And the food is excellent in both, but completely different. That's for sure. Right. <laughs> Well, we are going to talk about uh, one of your UCLA Bruins uh, Rose Bowl games tonight that uh, you have some interest in and, and sharing some great memories with. And that's the 1966 game when they played Michigan State. And uh, we're really excited to hear the history of this game. Well, it's, it's one of those games where if you is one of those great UCLA games that and it was actually one of the great Rose Bowl games that no one really remembers or really talks about because it had one of the great endings in Rose Bowl history that a lot of people don't remember or don't realize or whatever, whatever have you. It was a game, uh, like you said, it was Michigan State against UCLA. Michigan State was a 14 point favorite, okay, in that game. They were the number one team in the country. I don't think UCLA was even ranked, but they were in the Rose Bowl. They had defeated USC earlier and they had a roller coaster year. Uh, but somehow they, they they pulled it away. They pulled out in the, in the final seconds. Um, to talk about, give you a little background of, of the season heading up to that really quickly. Um, there actually was a rematch from a game earlier that year in the first game of the year. Michigan State hosted UCLA in East Lansing, and it was a hard fought 13 to three Spartan win. Okay, but UCLA under head coach Tommy Prothrow, which I've always considered the coach before the coach, because he's always preceded a great coach for that particular team. If you look back and I have a podcast topic that is brewing in my head all of a sudden. But anyway, <laughs> um, they were led by an unknown quarterback at the time named Gary Beban, who, of course, would later on become UCLA's lone Heisman winner. But they were they they lost in the season opener and there was one play in that particular game where Beban threw a long touchdown pass but was called back because of penalty. And if you know anything about Tommy Pro Throw, he was beside himself because it wasn't a penalty he felt, but it kind of like propelled them for the rest of the year. Michigan State pretty much ran through the rest of ran through the Big Ten that year. The big win of the year came on a 30, 37 to 7 win over Michigan, you know. And actually, excuse me, against Ohio State. And that pretty much propelled them to the Rose Bowl that year under head coach Duffy Darty, one of the great college coaches of all time. Again, not too many people talk about for whatever reason. And they had, and the key to that, to that team was their running game and, of course, their defense. And, of course, when you talk about Michigan State and their defense in the mid-60s, Two names popped to mind, and of course, that's George Webster and Bubba Smith, who later went on to play for the Colts. Um, but those two guys were the they, they were the engine that made that Michigan State Spartan defense go. And they rode that number one ranking all the way to the Rose Bowl that year under a under, uh, quarterback, Jimmy Lee, um, who was a great mobile quarterback and one of the first black quarterbacks in the Big Ten, you know, and, he, you know, and he was just an outstanding. He was the prototype quarterback for the 60s. He was a scrambler. He was somewhat short, but he was a scrambling quarterback and was very accurate. Um, as for UCLA, they after they lost their first game, then they went on a tear. They beat uh, Penn State, Syracuse and tied Missouri during that year. And, you know, when you say Penn State, of course, that's Joe Paterno. Syracuse had a running back named Floyd Little, who they pretty much contained. And they rolled that all the way to their big crosstown matchup against USC, which they ended up 
uh, knocking off in, in for that to, to advance to the Rose Bowl 20 to 16 in the Coliseum. But that wasn't the finale of the year. The finale, UCLA's finale, season finale was in the brand new Liberty Bowl Memorial Stadium against Tennessee, against the Tennessee Volunteers in Tommy Pro Throws home state. And they lost that game by three on a very controversial non pass interference call in the end zone, which was, uh, and it was turned out to be an interception that Gary Beban threw. And Pro Throw was beside himself again. And it was, he was so bad that he had to um, apologize to all of the coaches and the officials of Tennessee because of how he acted and how he called the, all of the things that he, all the names that he called the Tennessee officials, just all, all the officials during that game it was not. So you, you can imagine with that Tennessee draw that he had, what it sounded like. But, uh, but still, they were in the Rose Bowl. And they were facing off against the number one team in the country, Michigan State, and everybody thought that this was going to be a cakewalk for Michigan State. And unfortunately, and as it turned out, it wasn't. A very good game. Uh, I, I'm, I'm surprised, okay? Now, you said that they were uh, – they, the UCLA was 14-point dogs in mm -hmm. the Rose Bowl, you know, near where UCLA is, you know, much closer – they're much closer to the Rose Bowl than Michigan State is, but yet UCLA went to Michigan State and lost by 11. So I'm, I'm kind of surprised that uh, they were only uh, 14 point dogs. You, know, you would think that would be a, a much closer spread than that. But, uh, I, I think what it was was the fact that they probably looked at the strength of schedule for that game. I think it really looked at the strength of schedule, and of course, the, you know, the, 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 there was something there was a major East Coast bias. Of, of college football in the, even in the 60s. You know, they had UC, USC out in the Wild West, but they playing in the athletic, at the time it was called the Athletic Association of Western Universities, which be, later became, of course, the Pac-8. But they looked at that and they kind of like, well, that's back there, that's the West Coast, you know, they, they play a much tougher sprint of football on the East Coast and in the Midwest. So there was some kind of bias there. And of course, they also looked at the fact that UCLA had never won a Rose Bowl either. You know, they had played in, I think, four Rose Bowls up to that point and lost all of them. So they were looking at that and then they looked at the defense and they looked at the strength of Michigan State and they were and they were prohibitive favorites because of, I think because of, mostly because of the bias, but them losing as, you know, in the beginning of the year with UCLA losing by just 11 points, you're like, okay, they should have been closer, but for some reason, and UCLA showed to all of the odds makers that it should have been closer. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, these were, I mean, two spectacular programs. Uh, I mean, just to sort of put it in perspective, the 1967 NFL draft in the top eight, five players uh, were either from Michigan State or UCLA in the top eight. Yeah. Uh, you know, that's, that's amazing when you have five of the top eight or just from this one game. It tells you that the caliber of uh, individuals performing in it and the caliber of teams that are playing in this great game. And, you th and also, I think that's when, it, when, it, when everything started to turn. This is the mid-1960s, coming off the 1965 season, January 1st, 1966. I think that a lot of that bias started to turn, especially after this game and, and, how, and all of the stuff that happened in this game it was really a lot, but it was a great, great game and a great, great finish. And I think that it, it propelled UCLA into another level of respectability in the national, in, in the national consciousness of college football. Yeah, it's uh, I totally agree with you. Um, now this was a really uh, a sort of a watershed mo mo moment. Um, you know, Coach Duffy really uh, did a lot of things to bring uh, you know black athletes into the northern teams and uh, into you know what we call the FBS today. And uh, right. you know, he had, had a great all-star squad there, and it really sort of started the ball rolling towards uh, you know having more uh, uh, of you know the African American players playing on the big time stage in college football. That's right, because, I mean, you got George Webster and you have Bubba Smith and you got Jimmy Red quarterback, which was something of, a, of an oddity. But Duffy Darty, to his credit, uh, looked at talent rather than it, over everything else. And he wanted to win. And that was the key aspect of that. He wanted to win. And with him getting Jimmy Ray, again, if, you, if I had to compare Jimmy Ray to somebody that's 
like a contemporary now, the first person w- would be Lamar Jackson. That's who he reminded me of watching film of him. Um, somewhat short, you know, shorter than a, than you would want to want to have as a quarterback, but he was very mobile and extremely athletic and extremely accurate accurate passer. But Michigan State, like most Big Ten teams, really didn't run the ball all that, didn't throw the ball that much. Excuse me, didn't throw the ball much, and. For, and they were just the typical Big Ten team, put knuckles in the dirt, three yards in a cloud of dust type of thing. Yeah, it's. Uh, but we had the opportunity probably about six months ago to talk to Maya Washington. She is the daughter of Gene Washington, who was a you know great wide receiver uh, for Michigan State on that team. That's right. And uh, through through Maya, uh, you know, talking on behalf of her dad in this book, uh, you know, she had gave a lot of you know, great credit to, you know, to the quarterback, uh, to, to Jimmy Lee of, you know, doing a lot of great things. And uh, really he, he could have been a superstar and just had some uh, bad things befall him that uh, didn't, he didn't get the opportunity to do what uh, he that's could right. do, but uh, you know, spectacular athlete. That's for sure. Right. Now, another thing, now another thing about UCLA that gets overlooked is their nickname. That UCLA team's nickname was called the Gutty Little Bruins, and mostly because of their defensive front seven. The defensive front seven was tiny, to say the least, even for 1966. It were tiny. Um, the heaviest defensive lineman was John Richardson, which was a defensive tackle at only 225 pounds. That was the, that was, that's light. You know, for 225 pounds, and and something else about that defensive line was the was one of the defensive ends, guy by the name of Terry Donahue, which later would become the winningest coach in UCLA's football history. Terry Donahue was a part of that um, was part of that defensive line, and he would who I call Mr. UCLA because he was a player, then assistant coach, then head coach for like forever, and he is Mr. UCLA Bruin in my book. You know, but he was part of that gutty little Bruins defensive front seven. Yeah, uh, definitely. I think the defense was uh, definitely one of their the strong points of their team. But uh, who who did they have on offense? You know, they, we know that they were putting some points up that year too. Well, they had Gary Beeman, who was more of a running quarterback. Um, but he was, but he could throw the ball as well as anybody. Running back was Mel Farr. L- later played for the Detroit Lions. He was their tailback. Run a, a receiver was Dick Witcher, who was an All Pro with sent with the 49ers in the 70s. So that was their main cogs on offense. Um, and again, Tommy Prothrow with him calling the plays. You never know what you're going to get with him because he was what you were. He was the quintessential riverboat gambling coach he would call reverses and flea flickers and all kind of different things to catch the defense off balance and some of that genius you would see in this game because a key play in this game happened from his riverboat style looking back at doing research on it i said that and it would be a and it was a gutsy call when he pulled off <laughs> so i'm Tell you, these two teams are both very well balanced and great offenses, great defenses, and what a great matchup to come into the Rose Bowl to uh, basically, uh, it's probably playing for a national championship uh, here to say now if we look at it now. Yeah, exactly. And this had a lot of national championship implications, obviously, because you had Michigan State, who's the number one team in the country. And of course, back then, what they used to do was they used to vote on the national championship. You know, they, it wasn't like no playoffs or national championship one for, no, they didn't do that. It was voted upon by the writers and, and, the, and the Associated Press, which was crazy. We, I, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember dealing with that, having the arguments and stuff, but this was the way it was. And it all also came down to what happened, what happens at, in the other Rose Bowl? The Orange Bowl had had a lot to do with the, with the national championship as well. So it was, it, it was, it was, it was an interesting time in 1966 as far as like college football was concerned. It was very interesting, especially towards the end of the year when you would have a lot of stuff. A lot, there was a lot of chaos. Let's just say that a lot of chaos dealing with a national championship. Okay, so. Now we got we know a little bit about the teams. Why don't you tell us a little bit of what was uh, some of the high points of the game and and how it uh, came down to that close ending? 
Okay, they were a two touchdown favorite. Okay, UCLA was the two touchdown underdog. They had coming in with nothing to lose and everything. The first quarter went scoreless. Nobody scored. Okay, and the second quarter, Gary Beeman, the, the first of all, the Bruins recovered a punt inside the five, recovered a muffed punt inside the five yard line, which was the first crucial play of the game. A couple of plays later, Gary Beeman scored on a one yard touchdown plunge to give him a seven to nothing lead. Okay. And that stayed that way until halftime. Well, actually, Pro Throw called an onside kick. That's where the genius comes in. Right after the um, right afterwards, he calls an onside kick and the Bruins recover. The very next play, Pro Throw throws a 50-some yard touch uh, pass to Kurt Zimmerman, who catches the ball inside the five, and the Bruins score again, giving them a 14 to nothing lead at halftime. And they it just just one two quick one two punch in the middle of the se- in the second quarter to get the, the the Spartans off balance, and to the shock of the nation, it was fourteen nothing at halftime. On offensively, the gutty little Bruins was holding down the Spartans for much of the first half. Jimmy Ray couldn't really complete. In fact, Bob Apiza was the fullback. He really couldn't get started for the Spartans. So it was fourteen nothing at the half. Now in the second half. They started to run the ball continuously to run the ball and they started to wear down the Bruins defense. You know, it was like they would get five, three yards and three yards became five yards, five yards became seven yards. That way, all the way through. And then Michigan State finally scored midway through the fourth quarter. It took them until the fourth quarter to finally score. And that was on a, on a, on a Bob Apiza 38 yard touchdown run, ran right up the middle. Broke a couple tacklers in the Bruins secondary and was off to the races for 38 yards and a touchdown, but they missed the extra point. That is crucial. Whenever you see a missed extra point, even in the NFL, whatever, it always comes back to haunt you. And it did this case for Michigan State. Now, less than a minute to go, the Bruins, I mean, uh, the Spartans get the ball back and they drive down the field with less than a minute to play. So uh, Steve Jude, which was the backup quarterback, he scores on a one yard touchdown run to cut the lead to 14 to 12. Then they go for two. Remember, less than a minute to play late in the fourth quarter. They go to, for two for, to tie. Now, with a tie game, Michigan State still can claim a national championship with a tie. They still could claim one. But Doherty, of course, goes for two, had no choice. Has to go for two to tie the game. No overtime in college. They go for two. And that sets the stage for what is considered the greatest defensive play in UCLA's history. They pitched the ball to a piece of going to the right side. Out of nowhere is defensive back Bob Stiles, who is later named the Rose Bowl's most valuable player for one play. And what happened was he's a piece with this big, huge strapping fullback he goes around the right side styles hits him dead on at the goal line so hard that he knocks himself unconscious but he keeps a pizza out of the end zone and prevents the two-point conversion and ucla wins it is named they did a poll about maybe five or ten years ago that is ranked number 25 on the greatest sports moments in la history is him and there's a great picture of that right afterwards that when styles is literally being helped off the field he was still kind of unconscious but he knocked himself out to prevent a pizza from scoring and that was the ball game and it prevented the michigan state from winning the national championship wow so he's a he's a great hero and probably doesn't even know it because he's uh He's got the birds <laughs> circling around and uh, bells exactly. ringing and stuff. So, wow. <laughs> Stonewalls him at the goal line to, to save the game. Uh, that's yeah. a, that is a tremendous ending. And uh, I guess deservedly so gets exactly. that MVP, you know, uh, for sacrificing himself to, to stop that runner from getting in. Wow. Yeah, and it, there's a great picture of that, of the, of the aftermath after that, where two Bruin players are helping him, and he's like limp, and he's like like a sack of potatoes, and you can see pro throw in the background just you know celebrating and stuff and tapping this you know checking on checking on styles and everything but he was he saved that he saved ucla and it caused again controversy because later that night alabama played nebraska in the orange bowl 
and Alabama defeated Nebraska and ended up being claimed national champs. Really? Okay. So Alabama became the national champions and not UCLA for, for right. beating number because, one. Again, UCLA, I don't think UCLA was even ranked really? in that game. They were the, I don't think they were ranked. You know, but I, I, I have to look back on it. I think they might have been, but it wasn't right. They were, if they were, they weren't ranked very high, you know, especially with them being 14 point underdogs. Yeah. Wow. That, that is surprising that, uh, that they wouldn't be ranked on, you know, get the, the nod for knocking off number one. Usually the voting would normally go that way, you know, if number one. Well, fell. I think heading into the game, there wasn't ranked, but afterwards I have to check and see what they were ranked in the final AP polling, you know. Well, I, I know Michigan check. State ended up being number two uh, when yes. I was looking at some research earlier, but I, I was I just assumed UCLA was number one. I didn't realize uh, Alabama was the national champs that year. Hmm, very interesting. So yeah, I guess there would be some controversy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and again, and there there are countless instances in throughout college football history where there's been some controversy or some arguing back and forth or who should be number one at the end of the season. A lot of different instances. Hmm. Wow. But you, uh, that, I mean, I thank you for sharing that with us. Today. That's a, that's a great Rose bowl moment and uh, really helps us to celebrate this Rose bowl uh, 100 during this month. And uh, sure glad that you were able to, to bring us some, some great uh, information on that game and the great players and teams that, that played in that uh, to help preserve the football history. So thank you for oh, that. Man. Oh man, no problem, man. Anytime I get a chance to talk to you about football or, or specifically UCLA football, I love it, you know. <laughs> well, well, tell it. Tell us how are uh, things going on, on uh, the historically speaking podcast and, and some of the other things that you're doing. Well, right now we are anticipating who's going to be in the World Series because I am efforting a fellow podcaster colleague of ours, Chad Kane, to come on with me to talk to do a quick. Um, Historically speaking, sports World Series tale of the tape. Historically speaking, that is, of course, because, you know, who is ever in the World Series, I'm going to give like a little quick rundown of their World Series or team histories, whether it's the Astros or the Phillies, which, which actually is the Phillies who just won the World Series, who just won the pennant this afternoon, and, you know, whoever comes out of the, the, the American League. So that's coming up on Historically Speaking Sports and I have some other things that are just kind of rolling around in my head that I'm just trying to put together, piece together. But right now, baseball is on our postseason baseball, most specifically, is on, on, is on our minds here at Historically Speaking Sports. And um, we, I did like a little postseason, like a postseason field, you know, uh, kind of a tale of the tape, but their story, each team's stories in the pre in a postseason that made the Major League Baseball postseason. So that's what's going on with us right here. Okay, and and folks, uh, don't be confused. We're re are recording this uh, a little early. We're we're in late October, and I know this is airing in December. So make sure you go back and check uh, Dana's historically speaking sports on the World Series uh, uh, preview that he's talking about. But he's um, he's got a bunch more episodes since then too. But uh, we're we're recording this a little bit earlier than than All right. So. <laughs> So, uh, Dana, thank you very much. And I, I know we have you on for some other segments for celebrating this Rose Bowl uh, oh, yeah. 100 history. So we will talk to you again in a few days or a week or so uh, here on Pigskin Dispatch. We're talking to Dana Auguster. So thank you very much for joining us. Oh, man, thank you, man. Not a problem. I love doing this. We're taking a peek over at the chains and the down marker. It's fourth and long. We're going to have to punt the ball and get on out of here. But we'll have another series tomorrow for your football history headlines. So be sure to tune in. We invite you to check out our website, pigskindispatch.com, not only to see the daily football history, but to experience positive football with our many articles on the good people of the game, as well as our own football comic strip, Cleat Marks Comics. Pigskindispatch.com is also on social media outlets, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget the Pigskin Dispatch YouTube channel to get all of your positive football news and history. Special thanks to the talents of Mike and Gene Monroe, as well as Jason Neff for letting us use their music during our podcast. PigskinDispatch.com is a proud affiliate of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Hey there, Sports History fan. This is Arnie Chapman, a.k.a. the Football History Dude. 
And I hope that you enjoyed this recent episode presented by the Sports History Network and were able to learn some good old-fashioned sports history knowledge nuggets. I started the Sports History Network back in 2020 with the mission to help podcasters find a community of like-minded sports history nerds as well as helping aspiring podcasters to start their own shows. We have a little bit over 30 shows on the network right now covering all sorts of sports history, but as far as I'm concerned, we're just at the toothpick in the ocean moment, you know that. Can't even figure it out because there's so much more coming. We wanted to create the ultimate headquarters for sports yesteryear, starting with Podcast Network and our website, but we're going to continue to move into other mediums as well. And here's the cool part, because we want you to be part of our team. So if you're interested in starting your own podcast, or maybe being a guest on one of our shows, or who knows, maybe even writing an article for us over on the website. Seriously, all you got to do is reach out to us on the contact page over at Sports. HistoryNetwork.com. You can be as technologically savvy as a Neanderthal tapping on a stone trying to figure out this whole hieroglyphics thing back in the day. Again, it doesn't matter, because even if you don't understand the whole podcast space, we have a production team that can pretty much help you out with doing everything. All you gotta do, head over to SportsHistoryNetwork.com, head to the contact page, fill it out. That message goes right to me, and I'll reach out to you as soon as I can. But for now, dude, I'm through if you're through.